And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is that you Inky Savages are joining us for episode number 157 of the Penboy Roy Pentertainment Podcast. We are excited to be here. Thanks again for joining us. Now, before we get started, I just want to give you guys a quick heads up. We got an awesome show for you today. Today, we have our good friend Kevin from Fountain Pen Revolution, and he's going to enlighten us on his background story, everything that has to do with Fountain Pen Revolution, and his new storefront, too. We got a lot of questions for him. He's got a lot of answers. But before we get into that, let me get into some quick sponsorship reads. I know that you guys are tempted, tempted to just fast forward for the next few minutes, but don't, because I'm actually going to show you a pen that's really awesome, okay? But first off, Gold Spot Pens. Please check out Gold Spot Pens using the affiliate link in the description below. Click on that and make sure to use coupon code. We, we have to change it. We oh, we're changing the coupon code. Yes, okay. we're changing it. And on the fly, come up with something new. All right. We're going to change the coupon code to coupon code. Ah, gee, a lot of pressure, Tom. A lot of pressure. I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do this. Let's do coupon code. Betta, B-E-T-T-A. I like it. You know what? Actually, I was thinking of that same exact thing. I like it. I like Betta fish, and you know I'm a fish keeper. So coupon mm-hmm. code Betta. Make sure to use coupon code Betta at checkout for an additional savings on all products on the Gold Spot Pens website using the affiliate link in the description below. Save yourself some money. There are some exclusions that do apply because some brands feel like they are above discounts because they're snotty brands. I'm just kidding. I always say that but I don't mean it. So please check out Gold Spot Pens. Use coupon code BETTA, B-E-T-T-A, as in the betta fish, Mm -hmm. at checkout for an additional savings. Now, here's the fun part. I'm actually going to show a pen, and the pen I'm going to show to you is this new pen by one of my favorite brands, the Waldman brand. This pen is called the Titan, and here is what it looks like right here. Look at that thing. It's very tightness. You're going to have to describe this verbally for the folks that are listening to this. On... Right. So people who are not watching, what I'm holding up is a German-made fountain pen. The entire pen, absent the nib, is made of titanium, solid titanium, including the clip. What I love about this, and this, this happens a lot of times, this doesn't happen a lot of times with Waldman, is it's only one rotation to cap and uncap, not 4,000 rotations like the Zetra Vienna. But this whole pen feels really great in the hand. It's got some heft to it, even though it's titanium. It's not as heavy as it looks, but it's not as light as you would expect. It's all titanium through and through. It has a number five size stainless steel Yovo nib. It's a cartridge converter. And the great thing about this pen is, well, one, it's not a great thing. Don't post this pen. You're not going to post it. But because of the texture of the titanium, you can post it if you want to, but it doesn't post very well. But the texture of the titanium makes it feel like it's made of stone or some kind of smooth slate rock. It, it does look very feels, matte finished. It right. It almost matte, feels yeah. as though it's hygroscopic, which mm-hmm. it's not in the same way as the Homo sapien. Speaking of the Homo sapien, it almost feels like the same type of basaltic lava material because it's a matte finished titanium fountain pen. This pen is limited to 200 pieces worldwide. Meaning, I have not many pieces. one. There's not many pieces. I have one of the 200, and that's kind of cool. Even the clip, that's just the coolest thing. The whole thing looks uniform. Mm-hmm. I know that there are some people that say that it looks like other pens out there, like the the Esther Camden or the Lamy 2000. I know in pictures it may look like that, but when you hold it, very different in the hand. I love this pen. They're not also like made with full titanium either. So Yeah, well, this one is. Yeah. This pen here is made of full titanium from the finial to the blind, the bottom of the pen, the barrel, the section. Makes it very comfortable to hold. Mm-hmm. It's an expensive pen, though. I think, let me, let me look at what Bryce sent me, the price. The MSRP, wow. The MSRP is $550, but with retailers online, you can get it for a... 20% discount, making it 20% off of 550 And don't forget to use coupon code <laughs> BETA at Goldspot if you're interested in this pen to get a little bit more savings. I really do I'm enjoy this pen. still confirming with Bryce to see how many pieces we are getting of that, but we're, we should be getting something. All right, so, so Goldspot is yeah. definitely going to be getting this. All right, now on to our last sponsor. It's partially the reason why I'm so hyper all the time. BRLCoffeeCo.com. Please check out my good friend Neil Jackson. 
and his coffee company at brlcoffeeco.com and be sure to use coupon code ROY at checkout for additional savings on all products on the brlcoffeeco.com website. They got great beans, they got different roasts, they got different flavors, different flavor profiles, different caffeine contents, and the greatest thing about the brlcoffeeco.com is even the blondest, the strongest caffeine content coffee is a smooth drink. It doesn't give you the crackhead jitters, and if that doesn't sell you on coffee, I don't know what will. Now, like I said, we have an excellent show for you. We have a very special guest, Kevin, whose last name I can't really pronounce, so we're going to clarify that when we talk to him. And please stay tuned. I hope you enjoy the show, but before we get started with this week's episode of the Penboy Roy Pentertainment Podcast, I want to give you guys a quick disclaimer. This podcast is not scripted and therefore will contain potty mouth words, both from Tom and I, maybe from Kevin. I don't know. He, he doesn't seem like that kind of guy. Maybe he is. Who knows? But be forewarned. You haven't warned. Now, on to the podcast. The Pet Boy Roy Entertainment Podcast. Stage Savage. Okay, folks, so like I said, we have a very special guest. We have our good friend, Kevin. Kevin, can you just do, actually do us a favor and pronounce your last name for us? It's Teeman, like T Man. Teeman. Okay, Kevin Teeman. So we have Kevin Teeman on. Kevin, thanks for being here. It's really yeah, exciting. Yeah, glad to, to be on. You. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, Kevin Teeman, if you don't know, he is the owner and founder of Fountain Pen Revolution. If you don't know what Fountain Pen Revolution is, Fountain Pen Revolution is a brand of inexpensive fountain pens that offer different types of writing styles. If you're not very big into flex nibs, this is the guy you need to listen to. He offers very inexpensive flex nibs. Now, a lot of times flex nibs on the market, they cost hundreds of dollars, but pe the pens at Fountain Pen Revolution cost in the dozens of dollars. But the story, I feel like, is something that is going to be very intriguing for all of our listeners. So, t Kevin, can you do us a favor? Can you talk to us about you? How long ago did this fountain pen passion start? How did you get into fountain pens? How did you get into the Indian fountain pen market? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'd never even written with a fountain pen until about 2000. I'm pretty sure it was 2009. And I'll tell you how the whole thing got started. Uh, I was actually living abroad. I was working in India. Uh, I don't know if you have any Indian friends, but they normally have really good handwriting. Uh, and so I get made fun of all the time because my handwriting wasn't really good. And so I decided in 2009 that I was going to try to improve my handwriting. Been bad my whole life, but never too late to work on something, right? So I got online, started reading about, you know, what should I do to improve my handwriting? And one of the very first tips I got was we'll try a fountain pen. Again, had never written with one in my life up to that point. Uh, went to the store and bought, um, it, was a, it was a $6 uh, fountain pen made, made by Pierre Cardin. Instantly fell in love with just, I mean, the pen didn't last very long. It sort of clogged up and stopped working after a little while, but loved the pen instantly. And that's sort of where I got started with fountain pens. And that sort of also explains how I got started with Indian fountain pens. I was working in India, got into fountain pens, uh, then got on some, you know, like fountain pen network forum type stuff and was learning about pens. And pretty soon some guy contacts me and says, hey, I'd really like to get some Indian made pens. And I didn't know that was a thing. Uh, and he's not, what brands do you want? He's like, well, I want this brand and that brand. And so I start going to these stationary stores and just buying pens uh, and actually shipping them uh, across the ocean to this guy who wanted to try out some Indian pens. But of course, as I'm buying him pens, I'm buying myself pens. And I'm like, man, this is, this is amazing. So I'm buying a pen for you know $2, $5, sometimes 25 cents or 50 cents, because India has this, this long history with, with fountain pens and all school children used them. So they had to have a lot of really affordable pens. Right, and I'm kind of a cheapskate or frugal or whatever words you want to use anyway. So the idea of a, of a 50 cent, $1, $5 pen that worked great, love it. Um, and so really things, just one thing led to another. If this guy wants some Indian made fountain pens, maybe some other people would make some, want some Indian made fountain pens. So I started selling them on some of those pen forums. Uh, then was like, well, hey, let me start a website. Uh, really just thought I'd sell a few pens a month. Um, and really right from the get-go, there was just a lot more interest than I was anticipating. So then as I'm buying more of these, these pens, I end up, um, instead of just going to the stationary shops, now I'm buying them in large enough quantities that I'm going like direct to the manufacturers. Again, all sorts of little manufacturers that were like all over the country as I'd travel to different cities for work. Uh, I'd sort of network and find these manufacturers. 
Um, and eventually, it was like, well, man, these pins are great, but as I've learned more about what's going on in, you know, what people in other countries are looking for, if you could make a different type of pin, hey, if you could help me make something that's piston filled or cartridge converter, because there's a lot of eyedropper pins in India, then I think we could really sell a lot of those. And these, some of these manufacturers would say, hey, I would love to help you develop whatever you want to develop. Uh, and then we launched into not just selling those Indian brands, but actually sort of putting together our, our own line of pens and it's just sort of grown from there. In 2009, you said this was? I'm uh, pretty sure that's right, yeah. Okay. What were you doing in India before you started playing with pens? Yeah, I did a few different things, but the main thing I did is I managed a team of sourcing agents. So like agents on the ground that if you wanted Indian coffee or leather products or jute products or whatever, sourcing those products. So some of that experience definitely helped in working with these manufacturers and trying to get the type of products that we wanted. Oh, I see. Okay, so you you weren't in India because of fountain pens. You happened to just no, no, no. on them while you were in. Okay, and so in 2009, everybody makes fun of you because of your handwriting, which is yeah, understandable. And then that's how you get into fountain pens. You get into yep. fountain pens and you love it so much and then you start selling them. How long between the point where you started to buy fountain pens for yourself to where it became a business? I think, I think it was 2010 when, again, somebody contacted me from, through a Fountain Pen Network so, hey, can you help me get these pens, right? So I started improving my handwriting in 2009, start learning about these pens, and sometime within the next year is when, mm -hmm. again, just coincidentally, somebody contacted me and said, hey, I see you live in India. I'm trying to get some pen brands from India. Can you help me out? I see. So I guess my question is how long is it that this became a full-time career job instead of just a part-time thing? Because, like, I mean, you had a job before. Oh, yeah, and yeah. And that's question. why yeah. you were there. Yeah, and this didn't become full time until 2017. So it was always it was always a side hustle before then. Mm -hmm. uh, something I did on the side. I liked pens. Um, kind of entrepreneurial by nature. So the idea of trying to turn it into a business uh, sounded fun. Uh, obviously, now I've got unlimited number of pens that I have access to. Cause, you know, that's fun. Uh, so in 2017, we took it full time. Uh, before then, it was a hobby business and just always had done every, every year we'd grow by some ridiculous percentage as, as far as sales every single year um, and really didn't, you know, I remember talking to God and saying, hey, why do you why do you bless this business the way you do? And to be honest, all hell broke loose personally in in 2016, 2017. But the, and, and I need to change careers, just had some crazy family stuff going on. Uh, but the business had grown enough by then that, that I was like, man, instead of changing careers, I could actually create my own career. I could actually take this full time if we could take sales up about, I think I needed to grow by about 20% in sales. Mm -hmm. So I had th a three month window, sort of a transition from my old job uh, and put full time effort into it, grew that 20%. Now at that point it was like, we're paying the bills, you know. Um, and then it became full time, and we've continued to grow from there. So, who is we? Is are you married? Do you have kids? Is like, yeah, I've got three you... kids, and uh, they're not as involved as they used to be. Mm -hmm. Oh, but gosh, in the beginning, I mean, we were disassembling pens and cleaning feeds, and literally at the dinner table, you know, with toothbrushes, and you know, so they, they know how to disassemble them and reassemble them and all that kind of stuff. And still, you know, like my oldest is in college now and he'll be home for the summer and he'll work for me some. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I'm married, have three kids. So when I say we, I'm, I, you know, people call and they're like, are you the owner? And I'm like, well, I'm really like the janitor <laughs> and everything else. But yeah, we, we is the team and family. I do have an mm -hmm. assistant that works for me part time, Jenna, uh, and she does a great job. But we is mostly the, mostly the team and family. I see. And what was the reaction from your wife when you say to your wife, hey, I'm going to quit my full-time job and I'm going to just focus on my hobby and make that become my full-time job? <laughs> well, you're probably hoping for a funny answer, but instead I'm going to tell you, my wife left me during this awful period oh, and that sorry. was... Yeah, 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 it's 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 long past. I've been remarried. It's all good. But I was I 
needed to make some changes because of some family stuff going on. Actually, when mm -hmm. I took it full time, I was separated and mm -hmm. was like, hey, I can stop doing this and go try to fill out applications. Uh, so that I'm trying to find a way to make that funny. It's not. But really, this this business in a lot of ways helped me keep my kids together, keep our family together during a mm -hmm. during a really difficult period, for sure. Right. I'm, I can't even imagine that must have been really hard. Sorry, you can't make that funny. It was a little awkward, so that might be funny, right? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> but, okay, so that's cool. So 2017, is that when you officially launched Fountain Pen Revolution, or was it called Fountain Pen Revolution before 2017? No, it was called Fountain Pen Revolution pretty much from the beginning. And uh, where the name came from, by the way, if maybe you're going there, is, uh, you know, sort of the idea of, hey, we're declaring independence from all these expensive pens. But then also with the history of India is an interesting tidbit you didn't ask for, but uh, Mahatma Gandhi actually is the reason probably that Indians tend to have such great handwriting and India has such a prolific uh, fountain pen industry, or at least used to, uh, because he really valued that. Uh, I think that the, I'm trying to remember the exact quote, but, but Gandhi said something like, uh, an education is incomplete without proper handwriting or something like that. And it just mm -hmm. led to this, this real value within that society of handwriting. And of course you need pens to do handwriting. Uh, and so thinking, you know, Gandhi revolution, and that's, that's where the name sort of came from. Oh, that's cool. You said yeah. that the Indian fountain pen industry used to be booming, but then, or at least it used to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that? What do you mean? Is it not booming now? Was it not booming then? What's the story with the Indian fountain pen market? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So it is not booming now. Uh, there are a handful of larger manufacturers that I, I'm sure the vast majority of their business has to be outside of the country, uh, working for guys like me, making, making pens and nibs and things. Uh, there are several handmade uh, manufacturers that are still in business, Guider and Ranga and Rottenham Sun and... Uh, you know, just some different brands like that that have been handmaking pens forever and they're still around. But what happened is, you know, again, you've got, you've got this ton of people, not a super wealthy country, right? And every school kid has to have a fountain pen. Uh, and simultaneously, I mean, India has developed a lot in the, in the last, you know, several decades or whatever. But, you know, go back 30, 40, 50 years, you don't have a great national distribution system. And so every region would have one or two or three pen manufacturers and they would service that region. All right, so it was really fun learning about the history of pens in India and traveling, you know, I'd go to Kolkata, okay, who were the old pen manufacturers in this area and try to find if they still existed and visit them or whatever. Uh, but then once ball pens, ballpoint pens came around, it started to really hamper the, uh, the fountain pen market. And so now every, every Indian student, right, which is a ton, every Indian young person would have to have multiple fountain pens because it was required to write with them. And now they're all switching to ballpoint pens. And there wasn't as, you know, enough of a global market for these super inexpensive pens to keep all these manufacturers alive. So like mm -hmm. one manufacturer I worked with a lot in the beginning, a great guy, still, still stay connected to him some, the, the Sirwex Pen Company out of Delhi, India. Uh, our FPR Guru pen was essentially their Sirwex 162 body, and we just made some changes to it to turn it into the FPR Guru. Uh, they helped us develop a lot of things over the years, and then eventually it was like, man, we just we just can't get enough business selling pens, and they moved into distribution of school supplies. And mm -hmm. that was a story with tons and tons of these manufacturers. So yes, there was a booming market. Is there a booming market today? No. In fact, you go into stationary shops, and it's it's kind of sad. I mean, I haven't been actually been back to India in a few years, but you walk into these stationary shops and you're not seeing Indian brands. You're seeing Chinese brands and, you know, imported like some cross stuff and, and whatnot. Because the few people who are using fountain pens, well, they're you know, more like business people now and they're sort of buying nicer import stuff instead of the old, uh, more affordable Indian made stuff. Mm, I see. I was, I'm wondering what your involvement in fount with fountain pen revolution and the establishment of your brand how that affected the indian pen market i hope it has has kept some things afloat i mean i know mm -hmm. i know for the sirwex pen company for a while they're like man if we didn't have your business you know we wouldn't be doing this now again unfortunately they eventually went out of business uh that's what i hope is the case and i know that's the case for slightly the guider pen company uh, I, I would imagine i'm 
if not his largest customer, one of his largest customers for sure. Um, and that's something I do really like, appreciate. I'm, I'm glad that that's the case, that there's mm -hmm. this strong, long history of fountain pens in India and our little business can sort of help that survive and keep going. Mm, I see. And that's hopefully provide a lot of jobs along the way for people who could use a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, so, I, I kind of look at it as this way, too, though, with, with their the decline that's happening in India and the fact that they had a lot of kids growing up with using them in school that it's, I so I see this all the time, even with, let's say, people talking about Schaefer or, or Parker 51s and things like that here in the United States. The old United States brands that used to make pens like Estabrook dollar pens or whatever, they end up getting a, a nostalgic boost later on. Even though they're not being mm. really valued right now, you wait maybe like you know, another 20 plus years and then those pens will be in uh, trending again where people go and want to get them back in their collections because they're going to remember them from when they grew up and they're going to be like, oh, wow, you know, I remember writing with this one. This was this was the kind of craftsmanship that you would expect from like my, you know, my my nation and everything. So this is like uh, it, it, everything has a return. And I have a feeling that even despite the fact that it's kind of slowing down right now from what you say. I, I have no doubt that it'll like they're they're going to experience a renaissance of like a, wanting to get those student pens again. Yeah, and hopefully enough of the manufacturers are, are still around by then to to provide them. I do have a number of Indian customers come in the store. I'm, I'm in Dallas in Plano, Texas, and you know, oh gosh, I haven't seen one of those pens since I was a kid. I'm so excited yeah. to come get that. You know, what percentage would you say between the time that you? just first bought a fountain pen in 2009 till now, what percentage of the fountain pen manufacturers went under? Wow. I, I mean, I didn't do like any specific research related to that. Mm -hmm. I just know the answers a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't travel all over India, but all the different places I, I went to a number of large, larger cities doing the sourcing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there was, uh, there was at Humraj in Kolkata. I can't remember the names of all these manufacturers and they're just all gone. All the smaller ones are gone, mm. right? Even the Camlin pen company, if you're familiar with Camlin, that was one of Indian's bigger brands, got bought by a, was a Japanese company. So they're still making some of the old Camlin uh, pen, uh, pens, but it's no longer an Indian company. Mm. Uh, so if I was gonna guess, 95% of them. I mean, wow. that's a guess. None of that. Now, now that's of the, the companies that were mass producing pens for students, right? You've got the handmade pens, right? The guider pen company has been around for, you know, a super long time and Ranga has been around for a long time. And, you know, those, the handmade uh, manufacturers haven't, um, haven't gone out of business as much, but the, the mass produced manufacturers, I, I'd be surprised if it wasn't 95% or so. Oh, geez. Wow. And all because of the stupid ballpoint pen. So you were, say, you were <laughs> saying ballpoint. that you you were on Fountain Pen Revolution and people were wanting to buy Indian pens. And then you started reaching out to manufacturers. What was that process like where you had to just walk into a manufacturer, introduce yourself? What was that discussion like? How did you end up getting pens made for Fountain Pen Revolution? What kind oh, of man. That part was awesome. Um, I mean so much hospitality in India and uh, just enjoyed that aspect of the business so much. Traveling to, I remember working with the, 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 uh, the company that makes our feeds, uh, you know, traveling to whatever, gosh, what city he was he in, I don't even remember. And, you know, drinking so much chai, I thought I was gonna pass out as we we're discussing, you know, how can we make adjustments to these feeds? And, you know, we're trying, we were designing them specifically for uh, our flex nibs, of course. And so you need a lot of flow you know, and so I come in with my idea and this guy thought it sounded like the craziest thing he's ever heard. And so he'd go and try his idea and bring it back to me and we'd have another cup of chai and be like, well, that's good. But if you would, you know, because I've been carving feeds, you know, I mean, I destroyed a million feeds trying to figure out this design. So after about four hours, he's like, OK, well, I'll try your idea. And he comes back and we put it in the pen. It writes perfectly. And he's like, that is a good idea. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, and. I wouldn't be able to do what I was, what I'm doing now if I started now. 
because part of the deal was is there was again there were these smaller manufacturers who were willing to work with me and be very generous towards me uh, because they were happy to have the extra the extra sales right if you fast forward to now those manufacturers don't exist and it'd be hard to start off with probably the larger manufacturers that I deal with now right if I was that size now right. I couldn't deal with larger manufacturers uh, so it was it was a partnership for sure. They were, they were happy to help me design pens because it was good for their business. I obviously thought it was a ton of fun and, and awesome. I remember we're sitting with, with one manufacturer. The, um, we sell a pen called the Jaipur V1. There's a version mm -hmm. two now. There's a version one. And the Surwex company helped me develop that pen, but the way they helped me develop it is they introduced me to their mold maker. Uh, now, having molds made for products is expensive. I mean, normally you're talking about, you know, something like a pen is going to have like 15 different molds that are needed for all the different parts, right? And you're talking about eight to 10 grand a mold, depending on what country you're purchasing it from or whatever, and all these exact, and we're sitting down with this uh, uh, mold maker and he's writing measurements in like a hair's width wider. <laughs> and I don't even know what language he was speaking. And he certainly didn't speak any English, and so we sort of had the other manufacturer as a, as a translator, and we're going back for months, you know, hey, make a part. No, this has to be a hair's width. He'd write it down, a hair's width, you know, in, in his language, a hair's width wider. You know, like, you mean like a tenth of a millimeter? I don't know what that is. We have to be anyway. specific for these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, well, if that's specific enough for you, specific enough for me, you know. This is, not, this is not like cooking spaghetti. You're like, you need, it's just like baking. You need to have measurements that are exact. Yeah, yeah. What is a dash? Ah, whatever. <laughs> well, you said something interesting. You said that right now you would not be able to do what you're doing with these large manufacturers. Wouldn't wouldn't it be fair to say that those large manufacturers are where they are now because of their involvement with you in the business before? I mean, what percentage of 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 these larger manufacturers is is us, you know, is Fountain Pen Revolution. I don't know. I mean, I think we're significant. Uh, what I mean is it'd be with the smaller amounts of money and time I had to invest in the beginning, it was good that there were smaller manufacturers who were willing to and excited oh, to work with me, right? Versus you go to these larger manufacturers, hey, let's, let's make a pen design and maybe if it works out, I'll buy 500 of them to start out with. And they're mm. like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're a major manufacturer, right? We're not helping you design a pen so you can buy 500 of them. Or, or I think even in the beginning with some of these companies, you know, hey, I'll pay for the molds and buy the first couple of hundred. And if they sell, we'll go from there. And like, well, it's worth a try. Why not? You know, mm -hmm. and that would well, be harder possible, to do with a large manufacturer. Is it, is it possible, though, at this point, because you had said that there are still a significant number of smaller manufacturers to maybe like reach out to them and then have them let's say design something for you and then be able to bring it to a larger manufacturer that sort of thing well see that's what i was saying the smaller ones the smaller ones don't exist anymore uh -huh. well i was saying like maybe some of the handmade ones like ranga or okay. uh yeah like something like that where they since since they do they're used to making bespoke like one at a time or something you know they could let's say focus in on just making the design right and then you could bring that to a bigger mm. manufacturer to, to see if you could mass produce it. Yeah, and we, we do stuff like that now. Um, again, because these manufacturers know that we're going to, this is going to lead to big business once we get the pen design right. Uh, it's sort of fun designing stuff at this point. Well, it's been fun all the way along, honestly, but uh, because it's a, it's a back and forth with the manufacturer sometimes. Hey, I've got, I've got an idea that I think would fit well with your line. And uh, okay, so hey, I got this. This is a sample that one of my manufacturers put together. It's more of a torpedo design. Most of our pens have flat ends. Uh, it's going to have an ebonite feed and a new filling system they're working on. This is a prototype. It's not finished. Uh, you know, sort of have a piston style converter, but it's going to screw into the back because of the type of feed it has. I don't need to explain all that. Uh, but he said, hey, I've got, a, I've got an idea for a pen design. Can I send, you, can I send it to you? I was like, yeah, that's great. And he says, well, here's my ideas. And so right off the bat, I'm like, no, let's go for this and not this and, and that and not this. And so he sends me a sample and, you know, I could point out the seven different things about this pen. And I'm like, this is great, but we're going to make this adjustment and that adjustment. And it's going to be, a, I mean, it ends up being a six to 12 month process going back and forth, depending on what adjustments need to be made. 
Uh, so sometimes it's me coming and saying, hey, I've got a, an idea. Can we try to create that? But sometimes at this point, it's, it's a manufacturer I've been working with for a long time that says, hey, I've got an idea and I know your line that I think you'd like and we could, you know, we can design it exclusively for you. Can I send you over a sample? So it's sort of a fun back and forth that way. Yeah, I, I, I do dabble a lot in the creative process also for, for Goldspot doing exclusives and things. And it, I, I tell you, it's like such a thrill. And, and Roy has now has had extensive experience with that, too, with the uh, Pentertainment podcast pen that we made uh, that, that he had uh, worked with uh, Narwhal on and uh, and being able to, you know, call the shots from the, the trim to the, the type of material that's used and uh, the nib sizes and stuff. It, it is really like a thrill to just come up with something that just did not exist before and then yeah. dream up of what what I want to put in the world and what do I think that other people would enjoy writing with in the world and and then seeing that come into into fruition. So it, it is a lot of fun. Nothing strokes the ego more. I can tell you that. <laughs> so yeah. Nothing strokes the ego more than when it sells out, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but listen, we're we're here to talk about Kevin and his <laughs> creations, not my spectacular entertainment podcast, Narwhal Pen, that sold out in a single day. <laughs> hey, we Forget just picked up Narwhal, by the way. Okay, so actually, it's funny cool. that you know, I was actually thinking about, I wanted to talk about this. So, it used to be that you exclusively sold Fountain Pen Revolution brand pens made in India. And then you also had Wancher. I saw Wancher early on, okay? Mm -hmm. What, how, can you talk about the process of expansion from 2017 till current? What that process was like? What was that like for you? Was it scary investing into more brands, picking up more products, and then opening your own store? Can you talk about this? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, so, so in the very beginning, it wasn't just Fountain Pen Revolution pens. Again, it was all these small India manufacturers, and we eventually made Fountain Pen Revolution. Uh, but in it really hasn't been that scary picking up new brands i'm i am very conservative in my approach to business i'm not going to make an investment unless i can afford to lose that investment so we always start small so for instance i mentioned we just picked up narwhal let's see i've got four narwhal models over there in not all the colors that they carry right well and if those do well we'll pick up a few more models and a few more colors and sort of slowly grow from there um the having our own storefront really was because the business just grew too big. I couldn't run it out of my house and garage anymore. Uh, and if I was going to have to rent a place to do all of our assembly and all of our packing and shipping and everything, then why not also have a why not also have a brick and mortar? Uh, so it's really not, the brick and mortar is not the primary bread and butter. I've wrestled over the years since 2017 of you know. Would I want to have a bigger brick and mortar, be more of, a, you know, Drum Ghouls or Anderson or, you know, some of those that have the big brick and mortars and, you know, they're open the longer hours and whatnot. And, and it, it is really nice being able to do my email on the couch and come into the office for the amount of time that I need to be there to pack orders and do assembly and so on and so forth. I'm up at the office about six, seven hours a day. Um, Oh, it'd be hard to think about trading that in for, hey, I've got, you know, the big, the big, you know, not box store or whatever, but the open on Saturday, Sunday, open till 9 p.m. type thing. Mm -hmm. um, so we've intentionally sort of stayed small, but I, I, even I'm about to grow out of the office space that I'm in. And I was talking with my wife just a couple of days ago. Gosh, should I should I should I go ahead and consider expanding and, and carrying more lines and more selection? Oh man, I don't really want to do that, but it probably would be profitable, you know. Right. So you do have a a, a physical like display uh, type of storefront where you could go in and and check yep. out all the pens and and be able to handle them. And so, do you keep that open while you're up at the office? Do you have somebody that's that's working the the desk that can then show people the pens and stuff and let them try it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're. I'm normally up here. Well, I mean, my posted hours are, are uh, 10 to 1 and 2 to 5, Monday through Thursday. I take an hour off for lunch. Can't shop then. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I'll come back in on Friday morning. And so if I'm up here and those hours are available, then, yeah, I've got displays with all the pens and inked pens to try out and, and all that kind of stuff. And believe it or not, in the entire Dallas-Fort Worth area, this is the only store 
which which is crazy. I, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. The next that, closest store is a store called Drum Ghouls. I'm sure you're familiar with yes. in Houston. That's four hours away. <laughs> but we do get customers that come in because literally, if you want to handle a, a fountain pen before you buy it, unless you're going to buy a Lamy somewhere, right? There's some stores will sell a Lamy or maybe some cross stuff or right. or whatever. But uh, as far as a broader selection of fountain pens, we're the only store in the, in the whole Dallas Fort Worth area. Hmm. Do you get a lot of foot traffic coming in? Just people naturally curious, or is it just people mostly that know that you're there from doing a Google search? It's mostly people who are looking for fountain pens. Uh, again, if I was going to try to go the route of, you know, hey, I want to have a more traditional store, like that's I'm trying mm -hmm. to make that a, a primary part of the bread and butter, I'd want to be, you know, in a mall or a strip mall. I'm in, I'm accessible, but I'm not in a normal shopping area. I got you. So you're, so so you're not really like, for pens. you're not, you're not getting people who are, you know, they've got like the fistfuls of shopping bags, just looking for, you know, for, for things to buy. We just are like, Oh, you know, oh, fountain pens, this is a curious thing. They're, you get people that come in they're, they're They, they have one purpose, one purpose only. That is they want to try or buy a fountain pen. Absolutely. Uh, so everybody who walks in the door buy something because they've come to look at fountain pens generally with something specific in mind sometimes three plus hours away they come that far oh yeah oh yeah people all the time hey i'm in from uh, oklahoma or or you know how it goes you right you go to a city you haven't been in you look it up and you say hey is there a pen store here hmm, and yeah. you go to that pen store right so i was in uh, new orleans a while back and of course i'm going to go visit popular plume in new orleans because that's fun yeah. i don't remember if i bought anything but it's fun to go to the new. So yeah, I get people from all over the place. They're like, "Hey, you're the the local pen store," and by the way, you're the only one. I'm like, I know, uh, mm -hmm. and so they come visit us. You know. Yeah, I always feel bad that when because uh, I work at the Gold Spot office and it's just an office, so no, it does not have any storefront or or what have you. But a lot of people are somewhat under the impression. I don't know how, but you know, because of the fact that that's what we sell, that there would be some sort of you know, display case, some sort of front end where you could browse and see what's, but there is nothing like that. So it's just basically like, if you want to come, you could come to pick up something. You could come to, you know, maybe pull a few pens out of stock, but not kind of do the whole browsing, testing and, and all that sort of thing. But that's something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very envious. I, I want to be able to do something like that just because to get it into somebody's hands to try it out is is a much more you know thorough experience to then like create that connection rather than just seeing a picture of it online or seeing a video. Oh, absolutely, because there's so much to it. You know, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Well, show me show me how you write. You know, uh, okay, you want a flex pen? Let's talk about how to use that. Yeah, there's just yeah. so much more customer service you can can provide that way, uh, which is great. Yeah. What percentage would you of your sales would you say is from the store versus online? Oh, uh, five to 10. Not super mm -hmm. high. I see. And just because you've outgrown your home office, it's worth it to invest in an actual brick and mortar to be able to handle the business that is online even. Uh, well, it's worth it for a number of reasons, uh, but the most important of which is my wife was like, man, this is taking up too much of the house. <laughs> I love you, but you got to take this stuff somewhere, you know? So, so yeah, it's great to have my own little space where, you know, I can be messy back in the assembly room and, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever, as opposed to having a mess at the house. And, you know, you want to keep your spouse happy and it's better that way. Right, 100%. Happy wife. I, happy wife. I have a question regarding the when the business kind of first started to become its own back in 2017. Uh, you know, you said that there was that point where you where it was just you did the calculations. You said you had to get it up a little bit more than 20 percent to just be able to pay the bills and, and to be able to subsist off of the business. And mm -hmm. prior to that point, you were like they're making year after year, making ridiculous gains uh, in in seeing your your business grow over that time. So I was just wondering, like, when you went from having this as like a part time hobby to like, this is what I do full time and being able to put all of that time behind it. Did it really take that three months? Or were you just like within a matter of weeks, you could see Yeah, this is going to be no problem being that like you had all that momentum going upwards and like 20% to me sounds like it's not that much. 
to like have to get to that point and then on top of that investing that time that you would have spent otherwise elsewhere and fully being invested in it like that didn't Mm -hmm. did that was that much of a of an issue like how was that time that you just went from hobby to full-time that transition Mm -hmm. how was that for you good question yeah great yeah so i mean owning a business time doesn't necessarily translate into money uh, especially in a sales business right sales translates into income Mm -hmm. but I could spend all the time in the world and if it doesn't generate a sale, then it doesn't matter. So a lot of that ramp up was, was learning how to get more sales, right? Let me do some marketing research. How do I start doing some like, you know, Google ads type things, you know, more Facebook stuff where you're doing paid things and whatnot. So some of it wasn't just like, you know, well, if I just assemble more pins, then more pins are going to fly out the door. Well, no, if that was the case, that'd be awesome, right? Uh, It's getting the word out. Um, And so during that three months, a lot of that was, okay, now that I'm not just, I don't just have a website where I've got pins on it. And if you want to come, you come, you know, how do I drive more traffic to the website? How do I, you know... I, I outsource a lot of that now, but at that point it was like, yeah, I, I don't have the money to outsource, you know, Facebook marketing or, you know, Google marketing or whatever. So I'm buying books, you know, on Amazon and, you know, mm-hmm. learning Facebook this yourself from scratch and trying to exactly. figure it, trying to figure it out and everything. Where did you see the, where, where did you see, like, I guess, like the biggest benefit and where did that, that 20% come from? Was it, was it like pay-per-click type of advertising or did you find some other way to, to, to generate that additional in, uh, income during that time? Gosh, that's a great question. I and mean, we started doing, I started doing a lot more on social media. Okay. I would imagine that was probably the biggest thing, right? We're going to do more giveaways and posts. Uh, and so that wasn't actually paid. A lot of that was organic, you know, especially giveaways and things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't have a ton of money to spend on advertising. So anything I could do organic, I was, more than happy to try to do. So I I would imagine that probably organic type social media stuff was the biggest avenue for growth once we put more time into doing that. Yeah, and that's that's a big, I mean, I think people don't realize it because it's just like, oh, you know, it's like social media is like it's a Gen Z thing. It's just like, oh, they just they'll just give it to somebody who's under the age of 20. Give them they're, they're on their phones all the time. They know how to post stuff online. It's like, no, it, it really does, especially when you're trying to do it in a tactful way for a business and trying to have the end goal of that business account to be driving sales. But also not only that, but like doing it in a way that builds an audience at the same time. It doesn't make you feel salesy is is a, is an art form that you you are you are straddling a very very thin line and mm-hmm. it that that requires a lot of time in like learning the platforms learning the audience that you're trying to reach and everything and that's where i think like what you're just saying like going from it being a hobby to full time that's where you could invest that additional time and knowledge into just building that and then seeing a lot of that um you know a lot of that growth come from that particular angle Absolutely. And then those platforms are always changing too, right? Uh, but, you know, I'm glad that I did do that. I, 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 do, I do outsource a lot of that now. Not the organic stuff, but a lot of the paid stuff. But I'm really glad yeah. that I handled it on my own to begin with because it at least gave me a benchmark. You know, hey, if you can't do better than this, I can do that on my own. You know, right. so if I'm going to pay you, you better be beating this because that's what I did with my Facebook for Dummies book, you know. <laughs> and there's a lot of snake oil salesmen out there that will tell you they can make it rain. Uh, especially when it comes to doing pay-per-click stuff or whatever, or, or even with like the social media stuff, SEO stuff, they're, they're going to come with you and be like, I will get you to first results on Google and, and I'll, you know, I'll get you this, this kind of ROI on your, and they have no idea they're going to be, you know, wasting all of your ad money and, and just draining your account. And then you're going to go look back and be like, well, what was that all for? It's like, oh, you know, that just... So if you know how to do it yourself, you know the ins and outs of it, you have that benchmark set, that's the perfect way to do it because then you could just say, I just need somebody to just do the things that I was doing and just at least maintain or improve upon that benchmark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. You can get nickel and dimed. I mean, it's like once we, I guess once we grew to the size that somehow magically people who market their business services knew that we maybe had enough money to, you know, I mean, I get... tons of emails every day um and so have to be very picky about you know who are we going to hire and hey i noticed that last month's roi because yes i am keeping up with that you know (laughs) so there's a lot you're right if if you lose track of it um you get in trouble fast 
Mm-hmm. You know, I'm actually realizing as I was listening to Tom talk about this, how similar, I guess, positions you guys are in, right? So like, Tom, you built the Gold Spot name, I guess from 2017 till now, using social media and all the ways of communicating the same way Kevin did. Well, I, I, when you talk about like YouTube particularly, but I was, mm-hmm. I, I've been, I've been, at this since uh since i started working there it was 15 years ago mm-hmm. and b- before you know really social i mean social media was still a thing back in 2007 2008 but it certainly had it developed into a completely different thing like kevin was saying before it's a constantly changing atmosphere that uh the rules that applied a couple years ago don't apply now and they're just mm-hmm. completely changed Mm-hmm. So it it you know is the blogs were big back then so you're writing a lot of blog posts trying to get your links out there in different forums and things like that but you're really not doing that anymore you're you're more focused on making video content and doing mm-hmm. podcasts and stuff so it's it's a completely it's completely different but you just have to be kind of open minded about how things are changing and then apply the technology where it benefits you most and mm-hmm. trying to reach your audience right Having said that, Tom, I just want to throw this out there. You do this podcast because you enjoy it, not because you're trying to sell anything. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're all altruists, right? Yeah. You're right. Well, I mean, me in particular, I'm not selling anything. I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I do this because I enjoy Tom's. This is how we got into it. Me and Tom would just be on the phone all the time. And finally, we're just like, you know what? We got to record this shit so that people can mm-hmm. listen to it because it's just fun. That was it the is, first but... off-color word so far, by the way. I've been What's kind of that? disappointed. So yeah, that was the I know. first off-color word the whole time. So oh, far. really? Well, you know, the I don't want to detract from your story because it's very <laughs> interesting. I mean, between me and Tom, you can you can ask anybody who listens to us. We, we have potty mouth words all the time. But can we talk about the brands that you have that you carry now? Because sure. I know that before it, it wasn't as extensive as it is now. And Bryce yeah, from we... Luxury Brands was telling me that you're also picking up stuff from luxury brands also let's let's hear it oh yeah i'm super excited to add uh to add luxury uh so let's see and just in the last month we picked up platinum and uh i already mentioned narwhal i've got some noodlers ink on the shelf back there picked up some of those little ink miser things just because i think they look cool uh and that's just in the last month so we also carry i'm looking i'm sorry i'm looking at my pen case over here we've got Caveco, uh pilot Still carry some Indian brands you've never heard of before. There's a, you know, Kanpur Riders, some Camlin pens, some Airmail pens. So we still carry a bunch of those, those older brands, the ones that still exist. Airmail still exists. Um, again, Camlin got bought, so they kind of exist. Uh, what else do we have up here? I might have named most of it until we get to inks, right? I've got Urban stuff and Diamine and... Uh, organic Studios. We came out with our own line of ink, so we've got that. Caveco. I don't know. I don't know if I mentioned Caveco. We carry Caveco. You did. So I have a question. With all the brands that you are now carrying, mm-hmm. do you foresee or plan to end up carrying more of the more, I guess, brands that are more familiar with people, and then diminishing the Indian brands, or are you always going to keep the Indian brands as a staple to Fountain Pen Revolution? I don't, I don't see why I would ever stop carrying the Indian brands. Um, I mean, one, I like it, but two, there's, there's nowhere else. I, I, it's not like I'm selling a million airmail pens. Airmail's a, a Indian pen brand. I'm not selling a million of those a year, but if you want one, I'm the only place to get one for the most mm. part, unless you're going to fly to India and get it. Uh, and I like supporting the Indian market. So why wouldn't I continue to carry those? Mm. Uh, so I will continue to pick up, you know, your, your commonly known brands. Well, Lamy, I don't even know if I mentioned Lamy. We, we picked up Lamy a couple oh. months ago. Uh, or maybe it was six months ago. I don't remember. Sometime before Christmas. Uh, and I'll continue to pick up brands like that. But, you know, I've also been looking at, um, I've been meaning to place an order for forever. So forgive me, Magna Carta guy, if you watch this video. But Mag- the Magna Carta brand out of, out of India. Um, you know, I, I, I intend to continue to try to invest in that market also for sure. Well, I think so, it, it kind of like, it is... oh, sorry, could I, I just throw in one go, thing? Go for it, go for it. So, so like it. the Fountain Pen Revolution brand, especially like how you set it up with, um, you know, the, like being that the, the Indian brands are like a 
far, far less expensive than some of the other top tier name brands. I kind of feel that that, you know, that in that spirit, like keeping them, keeping those Indian brands in there and trying to keep it so that like you, you're, you're, you're kind of subversively undercutting the major brands by having good quality pens at very inexpensive prices seems to, seems to work with like what you're trying to accomplish. I think, you know, and like Kaveco, you said, great, like Lamy's great for that. Um, so like some of the, the, the pilot has pilot makes amazing pens for as inexpensive as they are, even mm-hmm. though they have pens that are thousands of dollars, like still the varsities are great. The Kakunos, mm-hmm. the, you know, Metropolitans are awesome. So mm-hmm. I, I kind of feel that that is like the, the spirit of what you're going for there. Absolutely. Mm. So in store, we do carry some of the more premium stuff. And we do that honestly, because I'm in Dallas and I have a store. And so sometimes mm-hmm. somebody comes in and is like, hey, I wanted the Pilot Custom Arushi. Yeah. I'm like, well, I, I guess if you want one of those, I should try to have one for you. So I keep some of that stuff around. But yeah, our bread and butter always has been and probably always will be. Hey, we're on the more affordable end of things, you know. We do more flex pens than anything else, but I love how affordable they are that we're able mm-hmm. to, to keep that that's so much lower a cost than, you know, even your Falcons and some of the other stuff out there that's not super expensive. But uh, yeah, I think that'll probably always be our, our bread and butter. So what percentage of your overall sales is the Indian pens versus all the other brands that you carry? Uh, now, does Fountain Pen Revolution count as an Indian brand? <laughs> Uh, by the way, it? not all of our pens are made in India anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so Fountain Pen, Pen Revolution, you know, something that has FPR in the title, uh, is, is over 80% of our sales oh, easily. Wow. You have to do the math. It might be closer to 85, 90. Right. So we're doing way more of those than anything else, you know, mm-hmm. or it all put together. Uh, then the other Indian pen brands, it's not a very big percentage. Uh, mm-hmm. worth keeping around. But again, I don't sell a ton of the airmail stuff or the Camlin stuff. It's almost a little bit more of a novelty because it's something different you can't really find. Uh, and again, very affordable. Uh, but yeah, the Fountain Pen Revolution line of products is by far the vast majority of our income. Now, let me ask something, bringing up another brand that's, I guess, a direct competitor to you. Was it difficult with Noodlers being around while Fountain Pen Revolution was gaining its footing? Uh, I don't think so. You know, Nathan and I even interacted a little bit along the way. He has his pens manufactured in India. I don't think that's a secret. No. Uh, And, you know, we use some of the same manufacturers. I won't necessarily name them, uh, but you could probably figure it out. Uh, I I don't, I, I never felt a whole lot of tension Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as, as as Noodlers limiting us or vice versa, uh, I carry Noodlers Inc. I actually wanted to carry Noodlers Inc. earlier, but there was a rule before, I think. I hope it's not still in place and I broke it that, hey, to pick up their ink, you had to also pick up their pens. And I was like, well, that's a little bit too much direct competition. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm thankful for Noodlers and the role they played in the market. And I, I, they sort of went before us in some ways, to, you know, using Indian manufacturers to develop these things. And I was able to, you know, hopefully not steal, but learn from their example along the way, for sure. Yeah. So Tom and I were looking at your website a couple of weeks ago. Tom, when did I go down to? I think it was like the 28th. I, no, the week before, it was the a, 22nd. It was like, yeah, it was middle it was of late 22nd. February. And we were looking at your website. That's when I called you on the phone. I was in Tom's office. We were looking at your website because we were talking about I was talking, I'm going to exclude Tom from this conversation completely because he doesn't want to be involved with it. But I was talking about this guy, Phil, from Twisby and how much of an asshole he is, right? <laughs> because he just he's just a dick a lot of times. So then I happened to come across your website and read the story of what happened between you and Twisby. Is this something you're comfortable talking about? with us and, and the listeners? Yeah, I don't mind talking about it. I, I put some of it on my blog. Uh, you know, I don't want to say a whole lot negative about Twisby. We did have an unfortunate encounter for sure. Mm-hmm. Cause I think the first time I always loved Twisby pens. Let me put it out there right now. Like I love the diamond mini. I just bought a diamond mini and yeah, great pens for the money for yeah, sure. I love the, love the pens. But one of the things that really pissed me off with Twisby and this guy, Phil was my friend, Frank, he owns Narwhal. Okay. Okay. Now, Narwhal uses a piston that's been out of patent for 
70 years. I, I can't even do the math. It's, it's a long time. And because he was using that piston, Twisby was claiming a patent on that piston that they don't have a patent on and was going around to all the retailers telling them to stop buying from Narwhal, otherwise they won't be able to buy from Twisby. Yeah, right? I, got, so, I got the letter. Since I was right. a Twisby retailer, I got the same letter everybody else did. Yeah, Right. So that was horseshit. And I told Frank that. I'm like, that's horseshit. Get a lawyer. I gave him all the things that I had in terms of like the Sherman Act of, what was it, like 1890-something, the fair trade laws and stuff, and he won. So Twisby sent out a retraction. But did they was, actually have a legal battle there? I mean, I don't know what you're allowed to Twisby, share. About them, Twisby didn't. Twisby didn't have. I'm not going to say anything that's that people don't already know. Twisby didn't have a leg to stand on, right? So they didn't have, in any way, shape, or form, the ability to go to retailers and try to manipulate the market that way. That's a violation of of trademark laws and and what and whatnot. And I called it out right from the beginning. I was right, as I usually am. But, you know, the great pens, great company, Twisby, I love him, but the guy's a dick. He's just straight up a dick. And I know that's like a mean thing to say, but he calls up retailers and he yells at them. He's not a pleasant person. What was your experience? Like, you're not carrying Twisby anymore? Is that the situation as it stands now? Or you yeah, I'm not carrying it? Twisby anymore. Um, I don't, I mean, Philip never called me and yelled at me or, or anything. Uh, I got their new um, retailer agreement. Uh, and I've, I've carried Twisby for, I think, the last three years and, you know, got the first, first bad my interaction with Philip. Never had a cross interaction with Philip, by the way, um, you know, until now. It's not like he cussed me out or anything. Uh, but, you know, in the beginning, the retailer agreement was like, hey, don't sell our pens below MSRP, which I'm not a, a big fan of that rule, by the way. But, but OK, whatever. You can set your rules. And like the minimum order size is $200. I mean, so there was like two rules. I can't remember if that's specifically what they were. I think I put it in the blog post that I did and I got the new retailer agreement and man, it's the longest, the most restrictive and the most threatening, maybe threatening isn't the fair, fair word, but like most of them are like, you know, Hey, here's the things you're not allowed to do. You know, if you violate this after the third time, you know, there might be an issue, you know, with other, with other manufacturers. And this was just very unclear what the consequences were. It was just going to be bad, you know, <laughs> uh, and I was not a fan. I was like, man, this just this feels like you're on my side of the table too much as a, as a seller. And you went from this much, you know, literally two sentences of rules and restrictions to, was it a seven page document or a 10 page? It was a long document. Uh, and so I responded and said, hey, with the signature page, you know, I'm, I'm signing the document, but this is the most restrictive and ridiculous contract I've been asked to sign in the however many years I've been doing this. I think you should consider a more, and I, I said it, I put it on, on the, the posts and people have reflected that maybe you shouldn't suggest that someone else be humble. It was like, I think, I think Twisby should consider a more humble stance towards their retailers, especially after the, and I cited the Narwhal Moon, Moon Man stuff from the year before. Mm -hmm. And just got a reply that said, well, that was rude. Uh, and then basically like, hey, we're done doing business. So I went home after lunch and talked to my wife who, you know, they're always the better sides of, you know, reason, right? And she's like, yeah, mm -hmm. it does sound like that email was not the most friendly, you know? Right. I'm like, okay, that's probably true. Uh, but I was confused from the beginning. So I was like, I signed the document. Like mm -hmm. I, I agreed to submit to your policies. So I emailed it back after lunch and I was like, okay, I agree that that email came across too strong. I do think you should consider changing some of these things. But like I said, I signed the document. I'm happy. Never heard back from the guy. I, mm -hmm. I thought maybe the email would fall into spam. I emailed it again three or four more days later. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out if we can work something out here or what. Uh, a week or two later, emailed uh, the headquarters in Taiwan because I'm like, well, this guy's not talking to me. Is there, you know, emailed him from a different email address. Like maybe it's in spam. Boom, nothing. Like I guess mm -hmm. I'd. I made him mad by insulting his his pretty contract, and that was it. We're never talking again. <laughs> so, right. so we put them all on sale for fifteen percent off, and I mean those things flew out of here at light speed, and <laughs> now we moved on to it. It, it may not be coincidence, completely a coincidence that I would have picked up Narwhal after we lost Twisby. That uh -huh. 
might have been related somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, Narwhal's a good brand. I, I think that, you know, you know, it's like you should be able to carry both. Nobody should be bullied into not carrying something. And, and I think... I think that if you feel like you need to stand up for yourself and say something or give your opinion on something, that you should be able to without, you know, being threatened. Like, yeah, feeling that there's going to be a loss of, you know, business or right. things like that. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised. I didn't – it, it, I guess it seems like he took it super personally. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. mean by saying, hey, this contract stinks, that you're an awful person or Twisby's terrible or, or right. whatever, you know. I've had, you know, I've contacted the Lamy guy. Love the Lamy representative. Uh, super nice guy named Tony drops by now and then. But uh, I, or, or was it was it Pilot? I also like the Pilot guy. Anyway, one of them, I emailed him. I'm like, dude, I'm finding all this stuff on Amazon that's cheaper than you said I can sell it for. You know, what's up? And they're like, called me. It was the Pilot guy, actually. Called me. He's like, hey, let me talk to you. What's going on with that? And, and you know, here's the things you can do and here's the things you can't do. But it's not like he took it personally. Like, right. I had personally insulted him or something. Mm-hmm. You know, just, it, it felt like maybe that's what was going on with this thing. That it was received as a personal insult versus, uh, bro, I don't like that contract. We're doing business here, you know. Right, right. Well, that's un- some unfortunateness that I'm, just, I'm sorry to hear about. But I, if we're, Tom, do you have anything else non-Twisby related? Because you, know, <laughs> you can't really talk about it. Otherwise, they're going to cut. They're not going to fill your orders at Goldspot. Well, I know, I know that uh, I know that we're at, at that hour point now, so you know we'll we, we'll wrap things up. Um, maybe Kevin, if you want to plug where people could find you, find Fountain Pen Revolution online, and and you know give you a follow and everything. Yeah, that'd be great. FountainPenRevolution dot com. I don't know of any other business called Fountain Pen Revolution, so just type that in. You'll find our Instagram and you know Twitter. We don't do much on Twitter anymore, but Facebook and. Maybe I'll eventually do something on uh, what's that one that the kids dance on? TikTok, oh TikTok, TikTok. Yeah. I posted a TikTok video a couple months ago. I was like, "This is killing me," but you know, let's try it out. Type in Fountain Pen Revolution, you'll find us. Come to the store and come see us. Awesome Great. stuff. Awesome stuff. Well, listen, thank you again for joining us Thanks, here Kevin. on episode number one hundred and fifty-seven. I I think we all had a very enlightening and good time. I think all the listeners did getting to know Kevin Teeman of. Fountain Pen Revolution. It was definitely a lot of fun. Thank you, Kevin, for being here. Oh, Thanks, man. Kevin. Thank you, guys. It's been awesome. Yeah. So, once again, Kevin Teeman, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Thanks again for joining us. Love you guys. Be well. Be safe. Stay inky.